eerily haunting true stories about remote abandoned locations rich in history. Come with us in our travels from state to state, if you dare. <laughs> You're the last time anybody sees us alive. I don't know where she has us, but we Hello? Gee, there is a beehive over there. Do you see that in the hole? Buckle up, buttercup. Welcome to 50 States of Madness. Welcome to 50 States of Madness. Hi, I'm Shannon. I'm are you still sick? I did good. Yeah, I'm still sick. Yeah, I can't seem to shake it. <laughs> but oh, um, I was talking to you and I wanted to bring it up right now before I forget and my memory fails me and before I can't talk anymore. Okay. Um, we we're talking because Halloween's call, coming up and stuff and we we're talking about comfy clothes and stuff and this is full disclosure, Gina's sweatshirt that she is not getting back because it is so <laughs> freaking comfy. So talking about things that never got returned, um, Kelly loaned me a skeleton dress a couple years ago for Halloween. I don't even remember when yeah. she was like, you were the one who told me like, Oh, Kelly has a skeleton dress. Cause we were dressing up as skeletons. I think it was for the haunted hayride. No, I remember that, yeah. but I don't even remember what you and wore. She had, it's like, a, it was like, it's a sheer dress, skeleton dress. And it's super cute. I remember what I wore. I, cause I was cuter than you. So you just blacked it out of Maybe. your mind. No, just, Maybe I was just jealous. So, yeah. Just a little bit. No, but Kelly had lent it to me and I washed it right away and I hung it up and we'll have to been, put the pictures in here I know. that maybe I can remember. Cause I don't, I, yeah. I remember I bought my dress there. Yeah. It was, you, it? yes. This little skeleton. It was a skeleton. And yeah. you said Kelly has and one. And then I wore my bat wings. Yes. But I don't remember what you wore. Kelly skeleton dress <laughs> that has not been returned to her, but has been hanging in my laundry room. And every single time you come over, I think to myself like, Oh, I got to return Kelly's dress. And it's just been hanging there. So Kelly, I swear it's still there. I haven't worn it. I wore it that one time. <laughs> uh -huh, I sure. It. I wear it every single day. Thank mm. you. Every weekend. <laughs> like, yeah. Every Halloween I twirl in it. <laughs> but it's been hanging there in my laundry room, and I need to get that back to you, Kelly. And I'm surprised you haven't stalked me for it. You should, like, <laughs> can you please, like, remind me to give it back to Gina? So. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'll make sure. Kelly's one of our Patreons. Yes. And a besties. We're not so. doing a Patreon episode right now. <laughs> we are. That's why I had to let people know. Like, <laughs> Kelly's somebody we both know. So, hey, Kelly. <clears throat> hey, girl. Hey, girl. So this week we are covering Adam Walsh and it's obviously we talked about it a couple weeks ago on a shoot the shit episode and um, I wanted to do a little more research before we did like a full blown episode on it but um, there's so much out there about this case and well, um, many many years in the making and father yeah. celebrity and well he became one since yeah then, but it's just so much um, information so i'm sure most people know who adam walsh is but his dad is john walsh who's on america's most wanted and um there's not, not as one of the people they were tracking down he was the host <laughs> of america's most wanted let's just clarify i always that. watched it like i loved it. it was one of my very favorite shows but i was always afraid that i was going to know somebody on there i was always afraid they were you gonna were like afraid? show a picture and i was gonna be like oh that's my neighbor <laughs> I would think that Gina would be hoping. I would well, think that I mean, she would be sitting in front of the TV going, please, this week. I mean, this yeah, week's the week right. that I'm going to know. You're right. You're right. I'm Actually, no, it's my neighbor. You're right. You're right. <laughs> yeah, you're actually you're Thank correct. You. But um, that a bit of excitement and fear at the same time. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Um, there's a lot of conspiracies about this case. There's a lot of, I mean, after doing the research that I did, I'm pretty convinced that of who did it. And that's the person that we're going to talk about today. His name's Otis Tool. Okay. But I know that uh, Jeffrey Dahmer had some connection to this case. There, His name was thrown around. There have been books written about it. And I've read those books. And I will say that, um, okay, wait a second. I'm going to go back to 
a couple weeks ago, we talked about you having to read those books. Yeah. You read those books. I did. Wow. I, Gina's a I, fast I, reader. I read all the time. I'm in yeah. my book club, and then I am reading another book at the same time <laughs> because we only read 100 pages a week for book club. And that's not enough for you. No. So um, as long as I'm not reading something that's like really close to the same genre, I'm okay. And Jasmine, my daughter, has turned me on to um, a book. Well, I forget the name of the author. I'll have to look. I'll put it up here. But the first book that she told me about was called Verity. And it was... I don't like love stories. I don't like romance books. I don't like any of that stuff. And that's the type of writer that she is. But she does have a couple um, a couple books that are not that. that. They're a little bit of romance, but there's a, there's a lot of other stuff going on. And this book what? sucked me in. I read it in one day. What oh, what was the title of it it's again? It's called Verity. What and it's, Verity it's a woman's mean? name. Okay. Um, Cause that's, you know, it's close to how I say, uh, yes, variety. <laughs> I say variety. That's so her I'm name really is off by it. Uh, Colleen Hoover. And the one that I'm reading right now is called too late. And the other one by her is called Verity. And um, if you like to read, I absolutely recommend you reading these books okay. so um yes so I've been reading those and then I um I will tell you what books I wrote I read um it's called Until Proven Innocent Jeffrey Dahmer's Dirty Secret um and there's two it's like a two two books and I will say that after reading those books um, if you didn't know the whole story, I could see where you would feel like he maybe could have played a part. There are people saying, you know, that come out and have said like that we saw him at that mall that day. We saw, you know, him in that area. Um, and I'll kind of get into it after when we talk about it a little more, but, um, but two serial killers can be in the same spot at the same time. Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> Definitely. They, there's not a rule where they can't yeah, where they be have the to same stay locations. Away. Yeah. yeah. But they have tracking dis- devices on yeah. each other. Like, I'm sorry, <laughs> you're in my zone. This is my right. area. This yeah. is the area I'm covering now. Stay now. away. This is yeah. These are my potential victims. Yes. You stay in your potential victims. Find zone. your own. Yeah. <laughs> um, but there, you know, we talked about it on a couple weeks ago on the shoot the shit episode. And, you know, there were uh I forget her name, but she's, um, she comments on like all of our videos and we, we really, really enjoy reading her comments and she's very well versed in, um, in a lot of the cases that we do. She's requested a lot of them, but she's very well versed in this stuff. And she was talking about that, you know, Jeffrey Dahmer didn't really target young kids. He didn't really target um, Caucasian kids. Um, he would, you know, mostly went for a little bit older teenage, um, mostly homosexuals. And so, um, obviously in the books that I read, they leave that part out, but, um, how convenient. Yeah. So I think knowing what I know on both sides, if you're just looking at, the Jeffrey Dahmer aspect, they make it sound very believable. You can make anything fit into your narrative. Yeah. Like you can make your story and put the facts to your story however you want. But but. I really would be interested in hearing people's um, opinion on what, you know, they feel with this case, what they feel about it. Um, Because, you you know, I'm pretty convinced that Otis Tool is, um guilty that he's the one that killed him but um you know I would just be curious to see what other people feel about it yeah. any any comments that people would leave would be they call him Otis 
It's not Otis. It's Otis. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. They call him Otis. Yeah, okay. it's Otis. But is it spelled like Otis it's, Redding? No, it's O T T I S. So Otis, okay. Yeah, it's Otis. No, no, no I was just asking. Yeah, and I, I think um, of Otis Redding. You know, sitting at the dock of the bay. No, I um, Wasting I saw. Time. <laughs> <laughs> she's kind of out of karaoke mode right now as you can see <coughs> but um <coughs> but i um i've heard i've listened to like many many interviews and stuff like that and it's everybody has pronounced it oddest tool so no i believe you yeah it just but it's very odd i've never heard that <coughs> name before and I, yeah Ever. it's like no I, w- I want to say, are there anybody else out there named an artist? I don't know. I don't think so. Maybe. You know how we always say when we Google one one thing, the name. No, Otis. that's what you do. I would be very happy to just continue on. So I'm just going to basically focus on on him today because. Um, well, you one you've read two books and done a lot of research on it so well it's no i'm not about. i'm not gonna focus on that on oh. the jeffrey Dahmer. so um i'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the story of adam walsh but um i'm just gonna kind of briefly touch on what happened that day well you say that but i think a lot of people are familiar with the name but not quite the story because we kind of touched okay. on that last time like mm-hmm. we know the name we know why we know the name right we broad like yeah he was a boy who was abducted but we really didn't i didn't know all the details of it i didn't know you know body location you know details about it you know because i think at the time when we when this story broke we were all pretty young yeah you know so yeah i don't know but go on yeah (laughs) so on the day quills kick it in okay go on oh is that good (laughs) is that a good thing (laughs) I got it. Well, first I got to take it, but I don't oh. know. I'm getting a <laughs> you little haven't taken it yet? No, not yet. Okay, oh, go okay. on. So on the afternoon of July 27th, 1981, Adam accompanied his mother, Reve on a shopping trip to the Hollywood Mall in, in Hollywood, Florida. This is not here in California. This is in yeah. Florida. So they went to Sears, entering through the north entrance. Reve intended to inquire about a lamp that was on sale and left Adam at a kiosk with Atari video games on display where several other, several other boys were taking turns playing them. So this was like right at the height of like when Atari was coming out. I was going to say, maybe you might need to explain what Atari is yeah, so to it's, some of our listeners. So it's video games. Um, it was like, like think of PlayStation, but OG style. Yeah. Like yeah. back in the day, back ping, the- uh, Ping, not Pong. Ping Pong, yeah. No, that wasn't Pong. It was Pac-Man, um, Mousetrap, Donkey Kong, Donkey, Donkey Kong, Kong Donkey Frogger, Kong. that oh, kind of stuff. Oh, I loved Frogger. Yeah. So that it was, was that kind of stuff. Games. So, um, But you know what we had in our house? What? In television. <laughs> What's that? Thank you. Um, it was, I think it was the Mattel's version of Atari. Oh, because your dad. <laughs> but it had like a little circular thing. Like it wasn't like a regular pad, like to move the things it was like this circle touch thing like almost like a mouse pad i want to say it mustn't have sold well (laughs) i don't think so in television look it up it was it was a video game system too but it was the it was for us people who didn't get the atari we played in television that's where ping pong was it was a little green ball that would bounce like this oh maybe i had that too yeah i think all of them had the pong pong, yeah pong game but um so so basically what they had was like um atari that was on display and they the kids would go there and they could play it so i think a bunch of kids had gone there and you know they would like play each other and then go back and forth so um especially probably the kids that didn't have it at home they were like we'll we'll just go play at sears (laughs) <laughs> so meet me at Sears at three and we'll play it at Sears. So it sounds like that's um basically where he was watching some kids play Atari. Yeah. And he was like six years old. Yeah. So Reve completed her business in the lamp department around twelve fifteen PM. She said that she returned to find that Adam and the other boys had disappeared. 
A store manager informed her that a scuffle had broken out over whose turn it was at the kiosk and a security guard demanded that the boys leave the store. The security guard asked the older boys if their parents were present and they said that they were not. Adam's parents later said that their son had been too shy to speak to the security guard who presumed that he was in the company of the other boys and made him leave by the same door which the boys entered and that was the Sears West entrance. His parents believed that after the other boys dispersed, he was left alone outside the store at an exit unfamiliar to him. So how sad because he's only <clears throat> imagine six years old. Yeah. First grader. And this um, this security guard, I believe she was it was a female and I believe she was 17 years old. She was young. And I believe I read that she had had an abortion the day before and so she wasn't feeling very well and she had to come to work so she was not you know because she wasn't feeling well I think she was just not herself and wasn't really paying attention to who showed up with who who belonged to who and just assumed that Adam was part of these kids and well i mean it's a good assumption to make i mean he's over there with yeah. them playing get video games and, and she stuff. um since has apologized over and over you know they've spoken with her uh the family has so so what a know, heavy weight to carry though i can't imagine for for a 17 year old yeah for anybody but yeah. being 17 years old you know i'm just like and 17 I, year old security guard don't you have to be 18 to be a security <laughs> guard at that point and I don't, I don't know. know. Maybe back yeah. then you didn't have to. I don't know. So meanwhile, unable to find Adam in the toy department, Reve had him paged over the public address system and continued to look for him throughout the store. By coincidence, which I feel is so strange, she ran into her mother-in-law, Jean, who helped her search for him. So while she was there at Sears, she runs into her mother-in-law, who's Adam's grandma. And so she tells her, you know, I can't find him. So she starts, you know, trying to help look for him. So after more than 90 minutes of searching and paging failed to locate Adam, Reve called the Hollywood Police Department at 1.55 p.m. On August 10th, a severed head was found in a drainage canal alongside the Florida Turnpike near Vero Beach, almost 130 miles from Hollywood, by Detective Ralph E. Latimer Jr. and an unidentified deputy of the Indian River County Sheriff's Office. Indian River County and St. Lucie County divers searched the canal. On the morning of August 11th, John and Reve appeared on national television saying that they still hoped that Adam was alive. A $100,000 reward was posted for Adam's safe return. Mrs. Walsh, uh, you were in the store, of course, with Adam when he disappeared. What, what do you think happened? I think that... Uh Someone could have overheard me tell him where I was going and talked him into meeting me there. Or he could have been chased out of the store by a scuffle that happened during the same amount of time. And from there, he was just scared and didn't know what to do. Now, you went to the lamp department and Adam wandered over to the toy department nearby. Well, we have to pass the toy department to get to the lamp okay. department, so. And uh, while we're on that subject, uh, uh, Mr. Walsh, I believe the uh, police would be anxious to talk to anybody who might have been in Sears on Monday afternoon between 12.30 and quarter to one in that vicinity. Am I correct? Yes, they, they feel they're quite surprised that someone hasn't come forth yet. They're, they're totally baffled by Adam's disappearance and convinced that someone has him, but they appeal to anyone that was in Sears from 12 until 3 that afternoon. 12 until 3. To please come forth and contact the Hollywood Department so that we could follow up on that. How was Adam dressed, uh, Mrs. Walsh? He had on a basically red and white horizontally striped Izod shirt, green shorts, and yellow rubber thongs. Mm -hmm. They were blue straps, yellow bottoms on them. He had a, a white, very distinct captain's hat on with a uh, navy blue visor. Mr. Walsh, there is, of course, a possibility that someone holding Adam might be watching this station, this program at this moment. What would you say to that person? 
we love Adam very much and we have no vengeance for the people that have Adam. We just want them to know that that the police and we would feel that if they could please drop him off somewhere, there will be no retaliation. We do not want to prosecute the people. We just want our son back. We we feel that uh, the people may be afraid that there will be uh, retaliation, and that is not the case. Uh, we, we are prepared to deal with them in any way, on any terms whatsoever. Soon after, the recovered remains were identified as Adam's. The coroner ruled that the cause of Adam's death was asphyxiation. The state of the remains suggested that Adam had died several days before the discovery of his head. The rest of his body was never discovered. The head itself would be kept in the morgue until the case's closure in 2008. Wow. How many years is that? 1981 to 2008. Wow. 17 years. Is that 17 or 27? That's 27 years. 27 years. Wow. Um, So the body still to this day has never been found. And that is... um, do you think maybe it's because um, Florida has a lot of alligators and crocodiles? Is it was it in those river I ways? Think or that, I mean, I honestly, I don't know. I, I don't know um, because this Otis Tool guy was once he was incarcerated, he was asked. He was visited by his niece, and she asked him where the body was, and he said, "You'll never know. You'll never find out." Why would he not want to share that? So that's sad. This was um, the fact that the body was never discovered is like a big thing in these in <clears throat> in these books that I read. Um, they're saying, and this is oh, this is this is one of the things that kind of got me thinking too. Um, they're saying that the head that was found, they don't believe was Adam Walsh. That's the conspiracy in yeah. the, in in the um and without having a body, you know, um there was a lot of a lot a lot I'm emphasizing a lot of mistakes made in this case. Does Otis submit to killing Adam Walsh? Um we'll get there, but yes. So they're you know, pretty much saying that because there was no body found um and then they're saying that the the head that was found was not was not his and there were a lot of mistakes made a lot of evidence lost in this case so i can kind of understand they also talk about his teeth okay um i believe that john walsh and his wife were in New York, um, filming um, a news show. They were being interviewed for a news show when the head was discovered. And they chose to stay there and be interviewed. And a friend of the family went and identified the head as being Adam. And it was said that they that this family uh, <clears throat> that this family friend identified him by his teeth by the gap in his teeth. Um, but there is some sort of mix up with if he even had teeth at the like, time because his teeth six, had fallen yeah. out. So that's about the time when they start losing teeth. Yeah. So his his permanent teeth had started to grow in, but were not to the point where you would have seen a gap in his teeth or whatever the case may be. So this, this is something that they're really, really stuck on is that it wasn't his head that was found. So, um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about, um, this man, Otis tool, Otis tool. So, Otis Tool was born and raised in Jacksonville, Florida. His father was an alcoholic who abandoned him, while his abusive mother would dress him in girls' clothing and call him Susan. 
As a young child, he was a victim of sexual abuse and forced incest at the hands of many close relatives and acquaintances, including his older sister and a next-door neighbor. He stated that his maternal grandmother was a Satanist who exposed him to various satanic practices and rituals in his youth, including grave robbing. Toole claimed this abuse began <clears throat> when he revealed his homosexuality to his family. Tool was often classified as having a mild intellectual disability with an IQ of 75, which is pretty low. <clears throat> I'm just, I'm very saddened by that. Yeah. This is some it's, of, it's very sad. Yeah. It's I mean, really even sad. though I know that he, it's just almost like he was groomed to be a killer. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. No, it's sad. It's really sad. Um. He also had epilepsy, which resulted in frequent grand mal seizures. Throughout Tool's childhood, he frequently ran away from home and often slept in abandoned houses. He was a serial arsonist from a young age, and he was sexually aroused by fire. Tool dropped out of school in the ninth grade and began visiting gay bars. He stated he had been a prostitute as a teenager and that he became obsessed with gay pornography at some point. Tool said that he committed his first murder at the age of 14 after being propositioned for sex by a traveling salesman. Tool ran over the salesman with his own car. Tool was first arrested at the age of 17 in August 1965 for loitering. Much information on Tool between 1966 and 1973 is unclear, but authorities believe that he began drifting around around the southwestern United States and that he supported himself by prostitution and panhandling. While living in Nebraska, Toole was one of the prime suspects in the 1974 murder of 24-year-old Patricia Webb. Shortly after, he left Nebraska and briefly settled in Boulder, Colorado. One month later, he became a, he became a prime suspect in the homicide of a 31-year-old Ellen Holman, who was murdered on October 14, 1974. With many accusations against him, Tool left Boulder and headed back to Jacksonville. So have they ever, well, I don't want to ask a lot of questions beforehand, but yeah. there's a lot of suspicion against this guy mm -hmm. in various states mm -hmm. that could have probably prevented him from heading back to Jacksonville. Yeah. And grabbing out yeah, of wash. He, yeah, he's, uh, you know, he's, he just, he's a drifter. He just, And you like know. you said, you don't believe in coincidences. No. And there's a lot happening surrounding oh, this yeah, guy. Definitely. So in early 1975, Tool returned to Jacksonville after drifting and hitchhiking through the American South. On January 14th, 1976, he married a woman 25 years his senior. She left him three days later after discovering his homosexuality. Tool later said during an interview that his marriage was a tactic meant to conceal his true sexuality. In 1976, Tool met Henry Lee Lucas at a Jacksonville soup kitchen, and they likely developed a sexual relationship. Tool later claimed to have accompanied Lucas in 108 murders, sometimes committed at the request of a cult called the Hands of Death. Police, however, discounted the uncorroborated claim of the cult's existence. There's the coincidence of Jeffrey Dahmer being a homosexual living in this area mm -hmm. at the same time that Tool's living in this area. Right. I'm sure they cross paths. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It I mean, wasn't I a don't, huge community I don't like think that Jeffrey Dahmer was there for a very long time. Um. Okay. But he, there's, there's definitely evidence that Jeffrey Dahmer was in Hollywood, Florida, within that week of Adam Walsh's disappearance. Okay. He worked, um, he worked there, and he actually found a body by the dumpster outside of his work. With or without a head? No, it was, oh, it wasn't, it wasn't the, okay. no, it was, it was, it wasn't a connection to Adam Walsh, but it was just proving that he was in the area because when they pulled the records, his name was on the police report stating that he found the body. Coincidence? 
Um, I'm not even sure if he murdered him. I think it was like a homeless person. Okay. But it just proves that, yes, he was living in Hollywood, Florida at, at that, that time. time. Okay. So I'm not sure if it proves anything other than that, but he was there. Yeah. Um, you know, at that exact time. So on January 4th, 1982, Tool barricaded 65-year-old George Sonnenberg in a boarding house where he was living in Jacksonville and set the house on fire. Sonnenberg died a week later of injuries he sustained in the fire. In April 1983, Tool was arrested for an unrelated arson incident in Jacksonville. Tool confessed to the crime and was sentenced to 20 years in prison. Tool signed a confession stating that he and Sonnenberg had begun a sexual relationship and after the two had an argument, Tool set Sonnenberg's home on fire. Two months later in June, his accomplice Henry Lee Lucas was arrested for unlawful, unlawful possession of a firearm. It was then Lucas began boasting about the murderous rampage orchestrated by the two. At first, Tool had denied involvement, but later began backing up Lucas's confessions. Lucas also backed Tool's confession to the murder of Adam Walsh. Journalist Hugh Ainsworth and others investigated for articles that had appeared in the Dallas Times Herald. It was calculated that Lucas would have had to use his 13 year old Ford station wagon to cover 11,000 miles in one month to have committed the crimes police attributed to him. Lucas became widely regarded as a compliant interviewee who was used by police to clear up unsolved murders that he had not been involved in, aided by Tool giving false statements in collaboration. So they were just using him to say that he did it. So that they can close cases even yes. though it was not <clears throat> the case yes, and they exactly. weren't even part of it. Because 11,000 miles in one month, is a lot to cover in a 13-year-old Ford station wagon. Yeah, no, it wasn't done. So, you know, that says a lot. Yeah. So during Tool's trial for murdering George Sonnenberg, Tool claimed that he did not light the home on fire and only signed the confession so he would be extradited back to Jacksonville. On April 28, 1984, a jury found Tool guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced him to death. Later that year, Tool was found guilty of the February 1983 strangulation murder of a 19-year-old Tallahassee, Florida woman and received a second death sentence. On appeal, however, both sentences were later commuted to life in prison. So they're just attaching him to these murders. But yeah. And he's confessing to them? Yeah. Okay. After his incarceration, Tool pled guilty to four more Jacksonville murders in 1991 and received four more life sentences. <clears throat> on October 21st, 1983, while he was imprisoned for two unrelated murders, Tool confessed twice to the 1981 murder of six-year-old Adam Walsh and eventually would recant both confessions. So he confessed, recanted. Confessed again, recanted again. I'm just kind of confused as how oh, how much are we taking his confessions, like with a grain of salt? Yes, or? because that's what him and this other guy... It seems like they're doing, there's a That's pattern That's what here. they were known for, was to confess to things and then recant. Yeah, because... That's it, like their MO. That's that's what they did. So, Tool claimed that he picked up Walsh in a Sears mall parking lot. Tool stated that Walsh came willingly because he offered Walsh candy and toys. Walsh soon wanted to go home and began to cry. Tool said that he then punched Walsh in the face. He then started crying again, and according to Tool, he began to wallop him, knocking him out. Tool eventually pulled over in a rural area and decapitated Walsh with a machete. He drove around with Walsh's head for several days, forgot about it, and after he rediscovered it, he tossed it into a nearby canal. So he just threw it in the back seat. It was just rumbling around back there, and he forgot about it. So a few weeks after Tool made his confession, Florida Department of Law Enforcement released that they that there were errors made in the investigation and that they had misplaced the machete that was believed to be used to dismember Adam's head, the bloody carpet from the car, 
and also the car itself that Tool was said to have used in the abduction. Hollywood detectives were unable to verify Tool's confessions because all er all the errors they made in the investigation. John Walsh, Adam's father, continues to believe that Tool was guilty. In 1997, Hollywood Police Chief Rick Stone conducted an exhaustive review of Adam's case after the release of John of John's book. So John Walsh wrote a book, and it's called Tears of Rage, From Grieving, Grieving Father to Crusader for Justice, The Untold Story of Adam Walsh. Um, at the time, Stone was a 22-year veteran of the Dallas, Texas, and Wichita, Kansas Police Departments and had been appointed Hollywood's Chief of Police in the previous year. Although the crime happened 16 years before the time of his review, he provided an analysis of the evidence, including a review of taped interrogations of Tool by Hollywood detective Mark Smith. Stone says that his review found evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that Tool murdered Adam. Stone noted that both Tool and Lucas were notorious for confessing to crimes that had been committed and then recanting them. In a book that homicide detective Joe Matthews wrote, after reopening the cold case in 2006, he uncovers details of evidence he discovered that was either overlooked or never been uh, considered. So in 2006, um, John Walsh and his wife, Reve, were, I guess, just probably to the point where they're like, we need to, we need to just figure this shit out. Reve had made the comment to him, you know, you're on TV doing America's Most Wanted. You're helping to solve all of these crimes. You're helping to find all of these murderers. But we're yet to find the person who murdered our son. So they they hired this Joe Matthews to, uh, and they it was a cold case. So they reopened the case and um, he discovered a lot of things. So he discovered that there were 98 photos that were taken by the Florida Department of Law Enforcement investigators that were taken of Otis Tool's Cadillac. Matthew says that the photos were never developed and he was the first person to see these photos. So even though they misplaced these items, they at least had photos of them. And yes. they never developed them. Right. So the photos included the machete, However, one particular image taken of the carpet behind the driver's seat blew him away. It was the bloody image of a young face. And if you remember correctly that I we do. saw this a couple years ago. Yes. Looking at it, you actually see a blood transfer from Adam's face onto the carpet. Traced in the blue glow of luminol was the outline of a familiar young boy's face, a negative pressed into the floorboard carpeting. Eye sockets blackened, blank cavities, mouth twisted in an oval of pain. An expert, an excerpt from the book reads. So in this picture, and we'll post it, it's the carpet from the backseat of the car where he obviously said, you know, he tossed the head and it obviously landed face down. But when they sprayed it with luminol, you can literally see the outline of what is supposedly Adam Walsh's face. What did we use that photo for? We had it on one of our episodes. Um, I don't believe that we put it on an episode. Oh, I think okay. we were talking about it when we were driving to either Wyoming or Texas. We were talking about the case and I happened to be looking something up and I, you, we ran and I just photo. came across the picture. That's right. Um, I, yeah, I don't think we used it in anything, but okay. I was blown away by this picture and yes. we'll put it in here. Um, the things we talk about on a cross country trip, right? <laughs> yeah. Just the two of us. Yeah. So on December 16th, 2008, 27 years after the 1981 murder, police announced that announced that tool was the murder and the Adam Walsh case was closed. The police did not reveal any new physical evidence and pointed out that they still had no DNA evidence. Hollywood, Florida police chief Chaddick Wagner said that Tool had been the prime suspect all along, but he went on to admit that although Tool's case was weak, he could have been charged during the original investigation of it. 
Wagner acknowledged the fact that the mistakes were made by the department and apologized to the Walsh family on its behalf. Wagner also acknowledged the fact that the lack of new evidence and the ability and the inability of Tool to defend himself could provide room for skeptics to doubt Tool's guilt, saying if you're looking for that magic wand, that one piece of evidence, it's not there. However, after the police re-examined previously uncorrelated evidence, they and the Walsh family were both satisfied with the new report and the existing evidence, which only points to Otis Tool. So, um, in, uh, 1996, uh, September 15th, 1996, Otis Tool died of cirrhosis of the liver at Florida State Prison. Um, his body went unclaimed and he was buried in the Florida State Prison Cemetery. Um, how do you, uh, well, this is just my ignorance. How do you die of cirrhosis of the liver without being a drinker? Cause you're in prison for all those years. Do you have um, access to alcohol or is it other, can there be other he causes? He was probably a heavy drinker before, before. he was incarcerated. Is that and the only way you can have time. cirrhosis? Um, no, I think you can. I think cirrhosis is mainly caused by drinking, but I'm sure you can probably, there's Get other, other ways. Um, there's other diseases that might cause it, but um, no. Uh, so, so he had died in 1996. So, it, you know, I guess not being able, you know, they're saying, you know, he can't defend himself. We can't interview him. But uh, at one point he did confess to it. And then he could twice, have Lucas, but, rec- yeah. but recanted it. Yeah, but well. I, I also feel like I, I, the majority of me feels like, yes, he did do this. But I also feel like they're saying that they ca- they closed this case and he was the person who did it. They're just saying that to close the case. But they do have the face of the boy. They do. In the back of the car. But again, like, I feel like there was a lot of corruption. Yeah. How do you lose a car? How do you just, the car just get, it's just That's, gone. Yeah. The machete's gone. You just misplace a machete? Yeah, I feel like though back the carpet, like I mean, I feel like even still now, a lot of evidence gets misplaced. Maybe huge warehouses of it. I mean, maybe we'll find out forty years down the line they'll move a box over, and all of a sudden it'll all be there. I mean, well, not the car, but you know, I mean, it just doesn't. Yeah, it sounds a little fishy. It doesn't all add up, but um, there was also um, in the beginning they kind of looked at a lot of people which they always do they look at the parents the family friends you know relatives all of that um at the time of adam's abduction there was a gentleman that was living with the walsh family and it later came out that his wife rave had been having a four-year affair with this man um, and so oh. he was also looked into. I'm telling you, the rabbit That's, hole of people you can go down is insane. And Walsh stayed married to her yeah. with this knowledge. Yeah. Because they, and normally, they're still married, right? Normally something like this, even if you have a good marriage. Will tear you apart. Will tear you apart. Absolutely. So imagine, you know, finding out on top of that, that your wife's been having a four year long affair with a man who is living in your house. Um, I'm surprised their marriage survived that because yeah. they're still married. <clears throat> I believe so. Yeah. I think I looked it up and they're still married yeah. till this day. Um, but who knows, you know, maybe this brought them closer together. Um, yeah. if you guys are wondering why it's just me on camera. <laughs> yeah. I'm not looking too hot right now. Yeah, she, so she's I was not, like, please she's not can feeling you well. So take the camera off me. Cause then you'll be seeing me blow my nose the whole time. <laughs> it's not a pretty sight happening right now. <laughs> Um, so John Those of Walsh you listening to po- podcasts, yeah. you're, you're having it good right now. <laughs> trust me. Um, so John Walsh founded the Adam Walsh Child Resource Center, a nonprofit organization dedicated to legislative reform. He's well known for his campaign efforts that led to the creation of the Missing Children Act of 1982 and the Missing Children's Assistant Act of 1984. 
He serves on the board of directors for the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. He also lobbies hard for a national sex offender registry, tough penalties for not registering as a sex offender following releases into society, and access by citizens to state websites that track sex offenders. So he's very much involved um, in a lot of things on top of America's Most Wanted. I'm very curious just to to hear everybody's um, take on this and what their opinion is and what they think happened and, you know. And if you were like me who really didn't know any of these details. Yeah. You know, you just kind of, you know, knew about America's Most Wanted. And the books are really interesting. I have not read John Walsh's books, um, so maybe I'll read on those. But, Yeah. yeah, other than that... Thanks for listening. Yeah. Thanks for yeah. listening. Hopefully Shannon gets better. I'll feel better. And hope so. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hope everyone else on the Carnival Cruise Line feels okay. <laughs> I don't think I caught it from there. Um, my husband went to Chicago the previous week for a business trip. And he got really, really sick on the business trip. And I think he might have brought it home to me. And mm-hmm. then it just, you know, because it ta- how it takes like five to seven days to. Yeah. Because it would have ha- it would have happened too fast, like, right? Because f- I actually felt sick while on the cruise. Yeah, on the last. Did night he go we on the there. cruise with you? Yes. Oh, so well. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you so much for listening. If you would like to follow us on Patreon, we are um, on Patreon dot com slash fifty states of madness. If you would like to support us, thank you to all of our Patreons. We're on all social media platforms at 50 States of Madness. And um, check out our merch. Yes. 50 States of Madness dot big cartel dot com. Awesome. Thank you to everybody who has purchased um, yes. any of our merch. This sweatshirt, I was just telling Shannon, I bought it right when we first got them. And um, I it was dead of summer. So I literally hadn't put it on until the other day. It is the most comfortable hoodie that I own. Yeah, I like, love the material. It's, yeah, it's Super ridiculously soft. comfortable. So, um, yeah, so check out all the stuff that we have on there. And uh, I think that's all. See you next week. All right, we'll see you next week. Be safe. Bye. Bye. Bye.